Welcome to more World of Warplanes content from the Noble Q, and in this video I'm going to look at the Tier 8 Soviet Premium Bomber, the Mir Sishchev RB-17. Hello there, and here on the tarmac outside my hangar is the RB-17, and those of you who know me may be asking yourselves at this point, where is the real Q, and what have you done with him? Such is my well-known antipathy towards bombers. Nonetheless, they are a feature of the game. And this plane was a design project only. No prototype was built. Uh, it was based around captured German engines, and when the Soviet design bureaus were reorganised, I think in 1947, this project was shelved. In the game, it was one of the earliest bombers to be introduced, and it was a menace. It was able to fly at low levels, in fact, at zero feet, at very high speed, and capture sectors extremely quickly and this provoked such an outcry that that kind of bombing was nerfed by the World of Warplanes team in 2018. Well, skip forward to 2023. Did I hear anybody say EF-131? Well, on the topic of overpowered bombers, such as the B-29C at Tier 8, the EF-131, and also probably the SU-10 at Tier 10, I think these upset the balance of the game badly. They're overpowered, and the feature of the matchmaker which allows anything up to five bombers or ground attackers per team is regularly used by the players on the EU server, if not the NA server, and you can often get games with two, three, even four overpowered bombers per side. Is the RB-17 one of these? Well, the answer is it, that depends on whether it's a Tier 8 game or a Tier 9 game, and certainly in some Tier 8 games this bomber will behave as if it is an overpowered aircraft, probably not so much in tier 9 games. So what we're going to do now is take a look at its numbers. If you don't want to look at a spreadsheet, use a link below to skip ahead to another part of the video. Here we have the spreadsheet for the three tier 8 bombers. If you don't know how this spreadsheet works, there's a link below to an instructional video Go and watch that and then you'll know most of what you need to know about this workbook that I'm showing you. The RB-17 has got some gun armament, which is unusual. You might have thought I was going to skip this section, but the rating is 10 and the cumulative DPS is 125. And it is a true forward firing weapon. It's mounted in the cowling. It's a single 23mm NS-23 cannon, familiar choice for Soviet aircraft. 125 DPS, as I've just mentioned, because there is only the one of them. 420 rounds per minute. Uh, rate of fire, range 2428 feet, and an auto aim angle. You can actually be off target by two degrees, and the game will correct your aim, and you will still hit your target. And it's got a pretty good dispersion angle for one of these cannons as well. It's 0.45, so it's a pretty accurate gun, and eight seconds of overheat. Now, you're not going to shoot down a full health aircraft with this very often, unless it just sits there and lets you shoot it and shoot it and shoot it, but you will be able to finish off heavily damaged aircraft, and that's quite useful. Don't neglect this cannon. Shell velocity is pretty handy as well at 1,457 feet per second. You don't need to give much lead with this. Now, the TU-10 has better armament by virtue of having two 23mm um, cannons, and this makes this one capable of at least resembling a heavy fighter, whereas the RB-17 certainly doesn't. As for the Junkers 288C, it has a turret mounted in the front, but that can't really be classed as true forward firing uh, weaponry. And I will just draw your attention to this 496 DPS, which looks massive for the rear guns. But because the guns are, are split forward and back, you're never going to get all of that to bear at once. So be aware, the defensive armament on the Junkers 288C flatters to deceive. Talking of the defensive armament, on the RB-17 we have another 23mm NS-23 cannon, in theory. And that's got 160 DPS and a mighty range of 3,281 feet. Watch out for this figure in the post-build effects. I'm going to show you something quite interesting. But even at this range, stock, you are probably going to be able to hold aircraft at that kind of distance or only allow them to catch up slowly and you'll be able to whittle away a lot of the health and probably get them to break off. As for the ordnance, the rating is 60. It's best in class. There are 18 bombs. These are dropped in three sticks of six each. Cumulative damage of 39,600 and a resupply time of very good 40 seconds for so many bombs. 
Damage race radius, however, is a bit smaller, 197 feet. You need to make sure you've got these bombs on target. And if you bomb from a height, it means that probably you're not going to finish off your objects that you're bombing, particularly big ones like, say, the power plant at a mining plant, uh, in one pass. So beware. Accuracy is something you need on these bombs. And I prefer to achieve that by flying the aircraft in a particular way, which I will explain later. Ordnance on the Tu-10, which is a very different style of bomb, I've already hinted that it can almost be pressed into service as a heavy fighter, it operates at a lower altitude, uh, you can use this as a dive bomber. So the Ordnance is only 30, uh, rated at 33 and the cumulative damage is only 20,000, but the resupply time is a very good 35 seconds and the damage radius in the bombs is a pretty good 246 feet as well so these are slightly more flexible you can be off target a bit these are dropped singly and if you get strength and hard points in this aircraft i'm gonna guess you're gonna get that down to around about something like 24 25 seconds uh, reload time which is incredibly quick and that makes up for the cumulative damage being so low more traditional bomber the Junkers 288c rating is 53 Cumulative damage is 40,000 on the bombs, 50 seconds on the resupply time, which is still pretty good, but it's the worst in class here. And the damage radius is also 246, but beware, accuracy on this bomber is probably something that you're going to have to work on. Again, probably by more by the way that you fly it than by the choice of equipment and bonus characteristics. Survivability, mm, not great. It's 40, it's only 1,500 hit points. The damage resistance is only 45, and the fire resistance is a fairly usual 60, but it's not special. Compared to the Tu-10, it's a slightly more robust aircraft. Um, we'll talk about how I would build this aircraft in respect of this survivability figure, and particularly given the way that I fly it in a later part of the video. Um, but my comments to the RB-17 would probably apply more so to the Tu-10, because this happens to have an extra slot on the airframe, which the RB-17, as you will see, does not. So bear in mind, you've got a, a survivability problem. You've got to sort of balance the aircraft's ability to get round and the need to be accurate, which implies that you're going to fly lower rather than higher, versus putting yourself in harm's way. And even with that good rear gun, if you fly into a gaggle of red aircraft, those 1,500 hit points aren't going to go very far. Airspeed is very good at 61 rating. Cruise speed is 248, which is a little bit low, so you need to work on that cruise speed, in my opinion. The boost maximum speed is 497, which means probably you don't need to work on this as much. Boost duration is a good 60 seconds. Probably not going to be doing much diving, but it is 528 feet per second, which is pretty healthy. And you might just be able to um, f um, dive away from some fighters at a pinch. It's probably not a manoeuvre you're going to pull very often. Maneuverability, well, it's a bomber. Um, and it's got all the maneuverability of a flying brick. The rating is 8. Turn time for a 360 degree turn is 22.8 seconds. Um, the roll rate is 40. Basically, you're not going to roll this aircraft. Uh, and the minimum optimum speed is 188. The maximum optimum speed is 373. Watch it. The optimum range for your maneuverability characteristics is only 185. That may seem like a problem, but you're not really going to be using maneuverability as a feature of this aircraft, so it doesn't really matter if you lose even more of what is already extremely limited maneuverability. Stall speed is a relatively low 75 miles an hour. It might be able to get things to fly past you at a pinch if you're really um, stuck. For instance, your engine has been shot out and you can't repair it. Maneuverability on the Tu-10 is much better. Um, getting up there for some of the heavy fighters, which again, I've already said this uh, aircraft can operate like that so you would expect the maneuverability to be significantly higher uh, overall the maneuverability on the Junkers 288c is pretty similar but maneuverability is really not something you're looking for on the rb17 nor the Junkers 288c it is something that you might consider uh, trying to improve on the tu10 i probably wouldn't but there you go it's something that's uh, there to look at Altitude performance, second best in class, but it's very good at 72. Now, with bombers, there is a minimum optimum altitude. And what this basically means is not the lowest level at which you can be before you can drop your bombs, when you're prevented from dropping your bombs, sorry. It's actually when your speed starts to degrade. And this is something um, which was introduced into the game back when the bombers were nerfed in 2018 so that they suffered if they started getting at a too low an altitude. And this was deliberately introduced to try and prevent the RB-17 from flying on the deck and dropping its bombs and thumbing its nose at the opposition as it sped off into the distance before they could do anything about it. So beware, at below 4,921 feet, your aircraft will start slowing down. 
Personally, I think this means that the times you take it below 4,921 feet, let's say 5,000, which is what it is, should be fairly limited. However, I see plenty of people flying up 2,000, 3,000 feet. I wonder if they're actually aware that they're slowing their aircraft down. You're not going to get much of a gain in accuracy by getting any lower than 5,000 feet, in my opinion, so why not try and observe this figure? Unsurprisingly, as it's a dive bomber, you can see the TU-10 can get a lot low without suffering that kind of penalty. The Junkers 288C has the same penalty. Maximum optimum altitude, 8,858 feet. If you bomb at that distance, I think you're going to miss quite a lot of your targets. Um, so I won't do it. I guess there will be some who prefer to try and stay high and keep out of the way of heavies and the like. I don't think that's going to be successful. You can't do it with the TU-10. You can do it with the Junkers 288C. I still think, don't think it's going to be that successful. Maximum ceiling, 14,764 feet. If you're up there, you're basically not taking part in the game. Climb rate. It's reasonably good for a bomber at 282, but you're not going to climb away from very much, and that's not going to be an escape tactic. However, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't pitch your aircraft up to try and get your guns to bear on the, any pursuers, um, and you'll see me do that uh, in the, uh, the later in the video in the battle replays. <clears throat> no power-to-weight ratio, because this is not a piston-engined aircraft. If I've got the thrust to weight right, and I believe I have, as far as the figures that we have in the game are concerned, this is extremely healthy, and this means that the aircraft is going to be fairly quick for a bomber to accelerate. And I think that's borne out by experience, and of course it'll be even quicker if you mount um, a combined injection boost system along with the upgraded engine. We'll talk about that later. The other two are piston-engined aircraft, so as you can see, the TU-10 probably is a little bit quicker to accelerate than the Junkers 288C. If we look at worst in class figures to see if there's anything to glean from there. We won't talk about gun armament, that's not very important. Um, the ordnance figures, uh, there's a mistake in the spreadsheet here, but we're not going to worry about that too much. Survivability, I've already mentioned, it's not the most robust of aircraft, that's just highlighted by these reds. Having said that, there are only three aircraft in this comparison, and none of them particularly robust. Maneuverability, we've already talked about as being pretty poor, and there's nothing else there that I think I particularly want to talk about. So, for me, this aircraft is best flown into the jaws of danger at around about 5,000 feet, as fast as you can, slowing down just to make sure you get all your bombs onto your targets, fly through, and then you've got a decision to make. Do you fly through the sector and fly off to another sector? If you've done enough and you've got teammates with you, you may very well consider that they can finish off the remaining parts of the sector, either the anti-aircraft, uh, the ADAs, the air defence aircraft or other ground targets if you've got a ground pounder coming in or perhaps another bomber you can fly off to another sector or quickly fly out of the sector get to a safe distance reload which of course will take place pretty quickly and then come back and try and do more of the same and that's the way that i like to fly this bomber that said i am not a bomber expert your mileage may vary so i think what we want to do now is go and see how i've set the aircraft up Here we are with the RB-17 on the tarmac again, and my aircraft is specialised. That means I have all of the equipment and consumable slots available. When you first get this aircraft, you will be missing the following. Out of five equipment slots, one will be missing on the engine. And of five consumable slots, one will be missing on the turret. In short, the experience of flying this aircraft stock isn't going to be drastically different, although these things are a nuisance uh, not to have, um, from flying it as a specialised aircraft. If we pop it back into specialist configuration, let's see what I've done. In the cockpit slot, we have the navigational radio equipment. And I choose this because it means that I can detect enemies more quickly, which means I may be able to avoid going into a sector where a human heavy or more than one human heavy is patrolling, and I can direct my attention to another sector where uh, the pickings may be easier. It also decreases the range at which I am detected, which means I may be able to make my escape all the more effectively. The alternative here, I think the most viable alternative, is building this aircraft as a tank, so you would put in cockpit armour, which will prevent your crew from taking injuries. I don't think taking injuries on the crew is ultra significant here if you're carrying a, a, a medical kit, which I do, so I'm prepared to go with the, the detectability, uh, reduction in detectability and the ability to see the enemy uh, more quickly. No point in putting on the G-suit, this aircraft doesn't have any manoeuvrability, uh, so increasing it is not going to benefit you at all. Uh, 
And as for the gun, although there is a gun and you should use it if you can, you're not going to get much benefit from increasing the accuracy of such limited weaponry. Moving on, this is important, you do not have an airframe slot. And for those of you who like to build your bombers like tanks because you like to fly them low and into the thick of action amongst the enemy, this is quite a nuisance. And that means you're probably going to have to rely on speed or you're going to have to rely on knowing who which enemy aircraft you're likely to come up against in a sector. Hence, that comes back to uh, the choice with the navigational radio equipment. And moving on to the engine, you've got two approaches. I'll show you both in the post-build effects. I've chosen to go with um, engine armour protection. This is because I tend to fly this bomber at its lowest minimum altitude where it remains as quick as possible. That's just slightly under 5,000 feet, if you remember. Um, and therefore it is exposed to fire not only from heavies but also fighters and multi-rolls which can easily get up to 5,000 feet. So I tend to go for the engine armour protection so that I don't have my engine knocked out as often. And then rather than the combined injection boost system I've gone for the uprated engine. You will remember if you looked at the number section that the um, cruise speed of this aircraft is actually quite low and therefore I think it's more important to get that up than it is to try and do something with the boost speed. And that's why I prefer the uprated engine. Of course, there's a penalty here on fire resistance, but it's not so great that it prevents me, as you can see, from mounting the first aid dressing package. On the turret, I've gone for the ultimate. I've got a turret gun sight. It's at ultimate level, and that increases the firing range of the turret. And when you see the post-build effects, you're going to see something quite interesting. And then the key thing for me here, uh, ultimate strengthened hard points. Um, and I would emphasize that you need to get the ultimate and probably nearly fully calibrated. As you can see, I've got this to 460 here. This will reduce your bomb reload speed to its absolute minimum and you want it to be as quick as possible. And again, you're going to see quite an interesting effect in the post build effects. On the turret, since I don't often do turrets, you can go for turret armor protection to increase the resistance of the gunner to res injuries or you can increase the aiming speed. Well, you can do that with a pilot skill there, the turret armor protection. I'd rather have the range, which is why I've dismissed those two pieces of kit. On the outboard weapon, I'm not sure why you'd want to choose anything other than the strength and hard points, because after all, you want to deal with damage, so surely you want to get the bombs reloaded as quickly as possible. But viable alternatives are the bomb site for accuracy. Well, you might want to choose that if you're going to try and fly this really high. Um, I don't think you're going to have a lot of success if you fly it really high, but the bomb site becomes more important uh, to you if you try uh, you take that approach. And if you don't mind just whizzing about the map, perhaps not actually finishing off sectors but leaving your team to finish them for you, then aerodynamic pylons will get you around the map much more quickly. So that's also a viable alternative if that's your play style in this plane. For me, I like to deal the damage. Strength and hard points is the obvious choice. On consumables, we are able to mount the first aid dressing package, which is pretty important. Um, you will lose your, particularly your gunner, quite frequently, and you want to put the gunner back in if you can, because that's going to be your means of deterring pursuing aircraft. I then go for engine cooling, so I get 10 seconds of extra boost. That can help you keep a pursuing aircraft at a sufficient distance where it can't shoot you, but you can shoot it. And if you lose your engine, you will want to put it back in. If you Again, if you're looking for speed about the map, you might consider improved mixture control. This is not the way I play the aircraft. Now, you don't need to load the gold. Uh, I do. The universal ammunition for turret will increase the chance of inflicting critical damage. If you want to really ramp up those chances, and boy, do they ramp up, then you can, if you are willing to pay uh, the World of Warplanes team money, mount the gold ammunition. And I've got so much gold, that's what I currently do. Otherwise, I recommend that you put on the universal ammunition. Definitely don't just leave it empty. It's a little bit of more of a tricky choice with respect to the gold ammunition, but if you're not going to use the gold, then definitely um, amount the improved fragmentation. But beware, with the improved fragmentation, you are probably going to find instances where your bomb drops don't entirely destroy special objects. Be aware because you will have to come back and finish them off, or at least hope that your team finishes them off for you. That's far less likely if you mount the heavy warheads, that problem seems to go away. There seems to be a tipping point uh, between the improved fragmentation and the heavy warhead, but the problem with the heavy warhead is it's gold ammunition, which you may object to using, or you may not be able to, uh, may not want to spend the money. 
The other piece of gold ammunition is quite interesting. It's improved explosives and it increases the maximum radius of blast damage and it does it by 40%. Now, I mentioned that the blast radius of these bombs is quite small. I have experimented with improved explosives, particularly with the view to trying to use one stick of bombs to take out a power plant at a mining plant. And that experiment failed. And therefore, I choose not to mount the improved explosives because in mounting these, I found that occasionally I wasn't taking out the um, special objects at other sectors, such as um, the military base um, or the command center, failing to destroy the main radar station. So if you are going to mount gold, I recommend you put on the heavy warhead. OK, time to discuss pilot skills. Here we are with the cruise skill dialogue is currently focused on the pilot. Incidentally, you can use these two buttons here to uh, toggle between pilot and gunner. And of course, the RB-17 is a premium aircraft, which means it's usable as a crew trainer. And nowadays, of course, you have a whole line of Russian bombers. So you may very well want to train your crews from those planes in this one. When it first came out, there were no other Russian bombers. Um, but it was suitable for training uh, ground attack aircraft crews and in fact in this instance I've got my IL-40P, the tier 10 Russian ground attack aircraft crew in the plane. If you were to dedicate pilot to this plane, and it's not one that I choose to do so but some people do, how would you go about it? Well given my build I think the best options are to emphasize damage so the first skill is the demolition expert no surprises there and then I emphasize the speed so we've got the aerodynamics expert here which increases the effect of uh, the upgraded engine and then we've also got engine guru 1 and engine guru 2 and then after that I've gone for cruise flight and I would probably go exactly in that order for a pilot that I was building afresh for this plane for the gunner Again, fairly standard choices. The offensive fire to re reduce the damage you take, that's my first choice usually. Then protection uh, precision gunner. This will um, f concentrate fire and basically cause more criticals, which is what you want. Via quick reflexes, I will eventually build up to this skill, ballistics expert. I don't think this one does very much to the armourer because that increases the burst length of an infinitely firing turret by 50%, i.e. it doesn't do anything as far as I can tell. But increasing the range using the ballistics expert skill is a very good idea. You get an extra 10% range. And then the next skill I would go for, build up to, is the quick reflexes to improve the aiming time on the turret. So those are the crew skills. Time to see what the effect of all my choices are on the base statistics of the aircraft. Here we have the spreadsheet showing the effect of all my choices, pilot skills, equipment, equipment levels, and so on, on the base figures of the aircraft. You'll have seen those if you watch the aircraft statistics section of this video. They're shown in columns C and D, and the effects of my choices are shown in column E and F. The difference between the two in absolute terms is shown in column G, and then they're expressed in percentage terms in columns H. There's a second comparison, which I'll talk about a little bit later in this section. Just as a reminder, these effects are achieved by mounting navigational radio equipment, special project engine armour protection, uprated engine, turret gun sight and strengthened hard points. There's no effect on the gun armament, so we'll skip straight over that, well the forward gun armament. However, on the defensive armament, there's a very significant effect. We have a base range of 3,281 feet, which is very good. But if I'm firing manually, and I emphasise manually here, we managed to get that up by 35.3% to 4,440 feet. Basically, if something starts pursuing you and it's at sufficient distance or you're able to pull away from it, you may very well be able to keep it out of the range of its weapons whilst you are pelting it with your rear gunner. You may very well deter it, and if it's stubborn, you may very well kill it. Now, if you're in automatic mode, the effect is reduced, but it's still going to take the range to something slightly over 3,600 feet, which is still very healthy. Ordnance, we've got a 60 point base figure, which has gone up to 110, 50 points increase, which is 83.3%. And this has been achieved in the following manner. We've got the cumulative damage of the bombs up by 32% to 52,272. We've got the reload speed down from 40 seconds to 28. That's a 30% reduction. And we've also been able to increase the damage radius of the bombs to 256 feet. That's pretty important because if, you, if that doesn't happen, you're going to find that you're not going to destroy special objects at uh, important sectors with one pass. 
more often than you would like. Small increase in the rating of survivability, one point. We've got 75 extra hit points, not that significant. We've got two points extra damage resistance, nice to have, but not that significant. We have lost nine points of fire resistance, a nuisance, but again, not that significant. Speed, it's been adversely impacted by the use of the engine armor protection and strengthened hard points. And the rating has gone down by two points to 59. It's not all bad news. Despite the effects of those two, those two pieces of equipment, we have been able to increase the cruise speed slightly by eight miles an hour. We have lost quite a lot of boost speed, 34 miles an hour. I'm prepared to trade that. However, it may be worth in experimenting with a combined injection boost system and dropping the engine armor protection. I haven't done that. It's probably worth a go. We've also lost nine seconds of boost duration. Even though we are, haven't mounted the combined injection boost system, we are getting adverse effects from the uh, engine armor protection and the strength and hard points. Maximum dive speed remains the same, of course. There's no effects on maneuverability. We'll skip straight over that. There's a small effect on altitude performance. We've increased the climb, climb rate by 23 feet per second to 305. This is not significant. Other effects? Well, I mentioned that the gun has got extra range. Um, but it's also got 85% chance, increased chance of causing criticals. And boy, do they come quickly. If an aircraft is stubborn enough to follow you and allow you to pelt it with the rear gun, you may very well find that you do four major criticals and you set it on fire. Uh, and it's one of my criticisms in the game that the rear gunners are too strong in some of the aircraft at the higher tiers. This is an example in point. However, when you're flying the RB-17, how nice it is to have it. Got a 10 percent increase in the turret aiming speed and there's just a note on the change in the range of the turret if you're in manual or automatic mode ordnance we've got a five percent increase in bomb accuracy nice to have survivability we've got a, an improvement of 39 percent in the resistance to engine damage coming from probably the camouflage uh, we've got and something else as well we've got a uh, uh, a 25 percent increase in concealment that's the navigational radio equipment coming into effect i'm pretty sure and we've also got 15 percent tolerance extra tolerance to aa damage and the way i fly this aircraft both of those things are really nice to have airspeed acceleration 15 and a half percent without boost five percent acceleration with boost and we've got a, a five percent improvement in the cooldown rate of the engines after you've used your boost no effects on maneuverability um and I've just made a note here that the bomb consumable is a heavy warhead. What I didn't do was over here is note that this one is improved in explosives. So I'll just do that now. And it's a good point to talk about the second comparison that we've made. And what we've done here is we fitted the combined injection boost system by dropping the special project equipment. And we've also used that uh, bomb consumable, the improved explosives. Let's see what we've got here. Guns don't change, they're the same as before. Let's skip over that. Ordnance, there is a change. Now, we've still got a healthy increase from 60 to 101, but as you can see, our damage has gone down from 52,000 in the other configuration to around about 48,000 here. Mm, this actually does seem to be a bit of a tipping point, actually. You wouldn't have thought that there was that much difference between these two figures, but I can assure you, I have noticed quite frequently I'm failing to take out the special objects at military bases or um, um, command centers with only the improved fragmentation. So you're going to have to be a, bit, a wee bit more careful here uh, when you're using the improved uh, in fragmentation. If, if you're not using any consumables at all, you may very well struggle to take out special objects and you're going to have to do multiple passes. Still got the ordnance uh, resupply time down to 28 seconds because we've still got the strength and hard points on. Now we've managed to get a slight improvement to the damage radius here to 276 feet. Is it enough? And I'm going to tell you, I don't think it is. And therefore, this is why I wouldn't. If I'm choosing between the two gold consumables, this is why I wouldn't pick the improved ex um, explosives. I much prefer the heavy warhead. I do not think this increase in the radius of the damage is sufficient to make the bombs, for instance, take out the entirety of a power plant at a mining point. And at that point, I don't think it's worth mounting. But I've put it in here for illustration purposes. Survivability has gone down from 40 to 39 um, this time we've still got the 1500 hit points we've actually lost a little bit of damage resistance one point doesn't really matter fire resistance well the aircraft will catch fire so mm, going down to 14 it's okay but i prefer not to go down to 46 points 
Uh, the airspeed rating has gone up by, uh, sorry, gone down by a single point this time. That's because we're still using strengthened hard points. We've still got the eight uh, miles an hour improvement on the cruise speed. We've improved the boost maximum speed by 13. The long and short of it is if you're going to use strengthened hard points, you're not going to be able to improve the airspeed uh, significantly. The only way you would do it is by dropping the strength and hard points and putting particularly air, particularly aerodynamic pylons. But uh, that's at such a cost in terms of the resupply time and the bombs. I prefer not to do it. If you really want to zoom about the map, then that's the way to go. Mount the combined injection boost system and also mount the aerodynamic pylons. Combined injection boost system, again, nearly drops the uh, boost duration down by nine seconds. Again, that's not particularly significant. No effect on maneuverability, of course. And this time we've got an improvement in the climb rate, which is still insignificant, of 87 feet per second to 369. As far as the extra uh, items are concerned that aren't shown in the UI, you've still got the 85% chance of criticals, the 10% turret aiming speed. There's the note again about the difference between manual and automatic ranges on the um, turret uh, gun. Still got the 5% bomb accuracy, still got the 25% uh, concealment. We have lost the engine damage resistance, uh, however. Gone down to 10% better AA damage tolerance. We've also got a pilot more susceptible to injury. Um, that's okay. Uh, but what's not okay is a 12% increase in the chance of your gunner being injured, because that could mean that you get your gunner shot out twice in quick succession, more certainly more often than it would in the other configuration. As far as the airspeed's concerned, you've got a big improvement in the engine cooldown rate that's because of the bonus characteristics on the combined injection boost system that i selected uh, we've got 15 and a half percent better acceleration with no boost and this time nearly 17 percent better acceleration without the boost and there's the note that the bomb consumable is gold improved explosives in this case this does not encourage me to fly this aircraft like this but it probably is worth experimenting with putting on the aerodynamic pylons um, and in that case, you will probably go through sectors, not entirely flip them, and immediately fly off to another sector very quickly. Okay, with that, I think it's time to see how this aircraft performs in battle. The forthcoming battle takes place on the Cold Peak map. It's the trial by fire variant, five sector map with the sectors laid out in the familiar five spots of a die configuration. And we have in the center a tactically important garrison, tactically because it allows easy access to the other sectors, not of much strategic value. The strategically important sectors are on an axis about this central garrison. They are military bases, one near each spawn. And in addition to the influence points that they can convey every five seconds, they also fire rocket strikes at enemy sectors not the other military base I should emphasize and that will happen unless your team goes and dies on those sectors incessantly the other axis there are a pair of make weight garrisons if we look at the order of battle we can see that uh, I'm bottom tier in my RB17 we have a top tier P228 heavy that's a good heavy and then we also have three Spitfire 14s at uh, the bottom tier. There was an event on during the course of this battle, uh, which meant that lots of fighters were being flown. The enemy has an extra tier 9. It is only a Seahawk and it's not specialised, but they also have a Tu-12 bomber. And then there are three fighters at tier 7, two Spitfire 14s and a Vampire. The way to win this map is to try and hold your military base at all costs, hold your local garrison if you can, try and possess the centre for longer than the enemy, but above all, try and find a way to get hold of the enemy's military base for at least part of the game, and certainly longer than they hold your military base. Ideally, you don't want to let them hold your military base at all. Let's go and see how this battle turned out. As we go into battle, I'll mention that this is a natively recorded replay file, and that's a good job, because you'll get to see me dropping my bombs through the bomb site and using the rear gunner, which in a World of Warplanes replay file, you would not. The other thing to mention is that our P228 top tier heavy quit the battle right at the beginning, and we fought the entirety of the battle minus a player. The enemy also lost a player as well at some point, I'm not sure when. So we're going to drop altitude to around about the minimum optimum altitude and head straight for the military base, which is important. And we're going to take out two gun emplacements. You can see me heading for the first. The next one is ahead and off to the right slightly, and then we'll swing slightly to the left and drop the third stick of bombs on the special object. 
That's the bombing run complete. Immediately switching to the turret gun sight to see if there's anything threatening us from behind. I can put some shots into the ME410, and as it turns out, I actually get the kill. Rear cover. You see it up at the right there. Now we're going to head off to the garrison. Don't want to fly through the middle. That's where most of the enemy is likely to be. At this kind of altitude, I'd be easy pickings for them. So we will head off to the garrison and support my military base. Mustn't die here. We'll drop uh, one stick of bombs and then we'll move off towards the enemy's military base. At least that's the plan. Key things to watch out for. Where is the military base firing? As it selects a target, it will indicate that by putting a blue missile above it and you should try and avoid trying to, to take out the same target, usually. If it's firing at the main special object and you want that for yourself, maybe you can be a bit selfish. So we line up a gun emplacement. We can see the military base is going to take out one of the shed complexes. I'll take the other. And the only other easily available target for me are the 1010s. That's worth doing. That's 15 influence points. And now we're immediately going to leave the sector. The military base can finish it. I will take the opportunity to shoot at some of the ADAs, keeping an eye out for other enemy aircraft. I make a bit of a mistake here. I fly into the side of the map. That will make you vulnerable. Try and avoid doing that. Fortunately, the enemy aircraft that was closest to us flew straight into the sector. There is now an aircraft heading towards us. I look at it. It's one of the enemy fighters. Begins shooting at me and misses by quite a long short. It's one of the enemy vampires. It's within range at the moment, so I try and speed up to get it out of range. You can see I shoot its pilot. That makes the guns inaccurate. Then I shoot its engine, and he makes the right decision. He gives up and flies away. So now I want to try and get the enemy's military base. I've got enough health to do it, just. Remember that our military base will not fire at this sector, so I've got to do this entirely on my own, or at least with the help of my teammates. The military base won't help me. So the first gun emplacement is bombed. Now we go for the special object. I've got a choice of two gun emplacements off to the left. I take uh, the further of the two. And then I turn and I want to try and get out of the sector. If I take damage, or indeed worse, get shot down, I want to try and be out of the sector. A lot of flak, of course, coming at me. Shooting the ME410. Take out its engine. That discourages it. It flies off. I keep shooting it for as long as I can. I lost my pilot there, but I didn't heal him because I didn't need to. Now we're going to replenish health, field repairs, slowly, and consider our second run in here. Got my bombs already, not going to wait for the health. Slightly risky, but if I can get these three uh, gun emplacements that are lined up quite nicely, we should have this set to one, two, and three. And now we want to try and avoid the flak and get out. If I've got all the three of the sectors, I should flip this sector, and there we go. We now have the enemy's military base. Now, I haven't got much boost left, and I now need to assess where I'm going to go next. We're about to... Uh, in fact, we have just lost our local garrison. That's the next place to go. I'm looking around, looking at the mini-map. I'm also looking to see that our military base is under threat. Probably I want to go there after this garrison, so this is a good direction in which to be going. We're probably going to lose the middle. I can see that the enemy is beginning to build up forces there. Eventually they get four aircraft in there and my team is not really inclined to do any defending. And now we're beginning to size up the garrison. Now a good bomber pilot will know a good route into every sector on every map. I don't, but fortunately I end up taking a good line into this sector. And what that means is that we have a shed complex ahead of us and we are easily able to swing off to the left and take the second shed complex and conveniently behind that there's a gun emplacement. Two sticks of bombs gone. Slightly late with that on the gun emplacement. Shoot what I can, which isn't much. My team has followed me in here so they finish off something which flips the sector. And now I can go and take... Uh, issue with the military base which has been captured by the enemy. So as we can see there, the enemy lost one of their Spitfires and our P228 never came back into the battle either. I engage my engine cooling, gives me 10 seconds of boost. 
Or maybe I just had 10 seconds of boost anyway. I'm using it to try and get here as quickly as possible. And we're going to take the same route in. Just bomb the same two gun emplacements if they're available. And also that special object again. Go, the bombing rung's completed. That's a Doolittle medal. medal. That's 400 capture points in a single sortie in a bomber. And now I want something to deal with this ME410. Fortunately, I'm getting assistance from a teammate. I help help him and we shoot down the ME410. Very nearly captured this military base. I'm fairly sure we're going to capture it without further um, work from me, and indeed we have. So the final thing to do is to fly across the map and go to the enemy military base, because that's the only sector they possess, and it doesn't look like they're going to flip any other sectors soon that are going to be nearer. Keep an eye out for threats. Everything's benign at the moment. I can eat my cucumber sandwiches and have a bit of a picnic. Now we see something coming in. Unpleasantly, it's an ME262. Looks like it's beginning to swing towards me, but in fact flies straight over the top of me. Very quickly, I get a few shots into it, and it disappears into the distance. And I was breathing a sigh of relief there. The other aircraft are below me, show no signs of going for me. At least one of them is a ground attacker, I suspect the other one is as well. And we're going to line up again the same route into this military base. Take the same gun emplacement, the special object, and then one of the two gun emplacements at the back. First stick of bombs is away. I lose my engine, which slows me down. Bomb the special object, and that means I can go for the nearer of the two gun emplacements this time. And finally, I am shot down. But it is the end of the battle. And we have a Thunder Achievement, a Lang Medal, and a Doolittle Medal. Not bad. Let's have a look at the outcome of this battle. We see from the centre it's a 4 chevron battle or a grade 2 bomber grossing 231,216 credits of which just over 77,000 came from a premium account bonus. If we look in the message box we can see that there were expenses of 4,700 credits. That was for repairing the aircraft, lost it once. No expenses for consumables. These were prepaid which means that I bought them in advance in a sale for half price. 3,810 aircraft experience, the base there 2,178, 1,089 coming from the premium account bonus and 543 from other bonuses. 190 free experience, that's 136 base and 54 coming from the premium account bonus. Couple of tokens, both for first medals of the day, the Lang, which I'm not sure I've brought you before, hence that's why I showed you that battle, and the Doolittle medal, but in addition there's also the Thunder achievement as you can see there. On the personal score tab, we can see that one of the class-specific missions is completed, that for sectors captured. Four-fifths complete on the capture points received, but only 88 sections of ground targets destroyed. And that's because I concentrated on the special objects. I guess if you want to get that number up, you're going to bomb tens, but you're going to slow down uh, capturing your sectors if you do that. 13,285 personal points, not the highest total. You will do better. I certainly have. Um, but I wanted to show you the single sortie achievements. Five sectors captured, two aerial targets destroyed, damage to aerial targets of 693, lost the aircraft once as I mentioned, 530 capture points, that was all for attacking, 15 ground targets destroyed, that's exactly the number you need for the Lang, has to be done in a single sortie and you need to win the battle. And 91,823 damage to ground targets. On the team score tab, we can see that that was enough for first place, both by personal points and chevrons on my team, would have been true of the enemy team as well. Now, this is the kind of battle where you're not opposed by heavies being played by humans, where you need to try to get the single sortie stuff done. That is the Lang and the Doolittle medal, and that's why I brought you this battle. That brings me to the end of the review section of the Mir Sishev RB17. And this is, when fully uh, configured, a powerful bomber at tier 8 and a competitive bomber at tier 9. And in the hands of a better player than me, probably a little bit too powerful. Well, I hope you found that informative and that if you did, you'll come and see my future content. 
please stick around. There's an unnarrated extra battle coming up, but this is where I'm going to leave you. So until the next time, this is the Noble Q signing out. <laughs>